so I am Alex Braun, and I am an analytics associate at Creek Carrier Corporation. I am our company's primary Tableau workbook developer. I also help train and assist our other Tableau desktop users. I am also our Tableau server administrator from the business side. I've been using Tableau for about two and a half years now, and I've been interested in working with spatial data since hearing about it last year at the conference. And I've been working over this past year on figuring out how we can implement this spatial data, go about creating this so we can use it in our day-to-day -day analysis. Uh, with me today is Matt Craig. He is a maintenance analyst with us, and I brought him along to speak with me because our maintenance department is one of the primary users of this data. So, Matt. Hey, thanks, Alex. As he mentioned, I'm Matt Craig. I'm a maintenance analyst at Creek Carrier Corporation. I've been using Tableau for about two years now, and my primary role is to develop our dashboards regarding anything maintenance related, and as, as well as work with other departments, accounting operations, anything regarding maintenance data, it's on my plate. And once Alex established our spatial data, um, I've been on the forefront of creating new reports, getting into up and rolling, um, so we have better, visi better visibility of where our trucks are over the road and at our Crete terminals. And lastly, my last duty with Tableau is kind of serving as a point of contact for our maintenance team, answering questions, training, any type of concerns that the maintenance group may have. So a little bit about Creek Carrier and what we are, where we come from. Creek Carrier Corporation is a private national full truckload carrier consisting of three divisions. We have Creek Carrier, which is our dry division, Schaefer Trucking, which is our refrigerated division, and Hunt Transportation, which is our flatbed division that operates out of Omaha, Nebraska. So Creek, and just as a note throughout the uh, presentation, I'm gonna to refer to it as Creed or Creek Carrier, but please know that all three divisions operate as one entity. So Creek Carrier was started in 1966 in the small Nebraska town of Crete, but in 1973, we moved to Lincoln, Nebraska, where we currently are. We recently just celebrated our 50th anniversary which was quite the accomplishment, and it's awesome to see the continued growth on a daily basis. Drivers, number of equipment, et cetera. And also, as a side note, we have 16 maintenance shops or terminals across the country going as far west as Salt Lake City, Utah, and as far east as New Kingstown, Pennsylvania. And again, being a maintenance guy, I'm gonna to refer to them as shops or terminals. Um, just kinda remember that it's all inside. And today the company has grown into a transporter of virtually any product. We operate over 5,000 trucks and 13,000 trailers, making Creek Carry one of the largest privately held trucking companies in the U.S. The uh, company adapted Tableau in early 2016, so we're relatively new, trying to get everyone on board. We have several different departments that utilize the Tableau, whether it's our operations team, our maintenance team, accounting, fleets, recruiting, you name it. We're trying to get everyone on board with Tableau. And as a trucking company, we realized we had significant opportunity to expand our function and analysis using the spatial data that Alex got rolling at Crete. While we've had basic geofencing capabilities for a while, uh, Tableau allowing custom SQL integration, we saw we had a lot of untapped potential, which we're gonna dive into here in a little bit. But today, we kind of, our goal is to walk you through the Creek Carrier story of how we set up this data, how we use it, so you guys, we can give you a shortcut to hopefully take this spatial data setup, incorporate it back into your company as it has taken us a while to figure out all the little problems and get it rolling how we want it to. So on the agenda today, I'm gonna walk you through one of our Crete demos or use cases, kind of give you an idea of our end product and how we use it and operate with it at Creek Carrier. Then I'm gonna turn it over to Alex. He's gonna to touch on how we set up our SQL tables with that spatial data. Then we're gonna further go into geofencing or our new areas using an external program called QGIS. Lastly, Alex is gonna to touch on geocoding GPS data using latitude and longitude points. After that, we're gonna walk through a few different SQL spatial functions as well as show you a few more of our Crete carrier use cases. So just kinda go from there. 
So our first use case we want to show you regards maintenance routing, what we call at Cree. So as you can imagine, with over 5,000 trucks and 13,000 trailers, we have a lot of equipment over the road. And one of the trickiest tasks are keeping up with routine maintenance items on it there. We have regular maintenance, preventative maintenance items. We have our safety recalls, campaign upgrades, you name it, as a maintenance team and group, it is our responsibility to make sure all of these items get done and done on time. So by integrating the spatial data, we are able to have better visibility into where our assets are, our trucks, in comparison to our 16 shop. And with all of our trucks being equipped with telematics, our GPS data systems, we can ping a truck at any time, figure out where exactly on a map it is at, how close it is to a, a shop or if it's at a shop, and then tying in our maintenance items, which I'll get to here in a sec, exactly what work needs to be done. So the, goal, the key goal here, um, kind of as background, we have several different operation programs at Crete. We deal with uh, AS400. We have a maintenance system called Sitaris. We needed to figure out how to bring everything together, simplify it for our users, our maintenance team, our operations team, our management team, our execs, you name it. They want to make sure our equipment is staying up to date and maintained. So we wanted a visibility of all that and kind of a one-stop shop for all these items. We're also trying to come up with a way, we had a couple issues that we were trying to solve. We had a productivity issue, which I'll touch on here in a little bit. We had a cost issue. We were spending way more money outside in comparison to what our inside shops are dealing with, as well as having a rather large list of overdue items on that maintenance list. So we're trying to kill three birds with one stone, and Tableau and this new spatial data really allowed us to bring everything together, make it extremely easy for the user to use. So I'm going to go into a demo with our first dashboard. So as you can see, this first one, we're dealing with the Truckstat shop case. Very simple dashboard, but again, please keep in mind our end users are our shop team management. They just want to know what needs to be done, where it's at, and in a quick and timely manner. So we're going to use Lincoln as our example. We'll go down here, filter, and as you can see up here in the map, we have an outline of our Crete shop or terminal, and all these points represent a specific truck. And down here below, we have our truck number, the type of work needing to be done, as far as the exact job code needing to be done. So we come over here, we can click one dot, and you can see this truck, 39424, needs this type of work, the exact job, and the overdue amount. So again, very basic, but the outcome of this is extremely important. Uh, also as a side, these dots also represent a, an estimated location of where at on the lot they are. So a lot of our time is spent trying to go figure out where the truck is, pull it into the bay, work on it, move it back out. This gives our shops and the, our technicians, our management team just more visibility and time saving so they can pull it in, work on it, pull it out just as quick. And then our second, very similar to that first one, we call it trucks near the shop. We're using a function that we'll share with you guys, with you guys here in a little bit, but we want to pull our trucks that are within 25 miles of one of our 16 shops. Again, it's set up very similar to our last example. We have our count of outstanding work, our detail over here and our trucks that are within 25 miles. So we're going to use Lincoln as another example. You can see in here all of our trucks are these yellow dots or orange. And as we zoom in, you can see this blue spec is our geofence at the Crete terminal. So if we hover over, click on one, again, in the detail we can see our the exact truck number the type of work needing to be done and the job, the distance from the shop in miles, so that's one mile, and the amount overdue, they're all gonna be negative. If it's one, it's usually a, camp a campaign or a recall, and if it is more than negative one, it's what we call a preventive maintenance item, like an inspection, uh, oil change, items like that. So that's one of our examples for you guys. And
the benefits of such a simple dashboard I just shared with you. Again, we're trying to fix three issues we had at Crete. The first one being product productivity. Like any company, you want your employees to be productive and happy. So at Crete Carrier in the maintenance group, we have a goal of 95% productivity. In layman's terms, we're taking how long you work on a piece of equipment over the time you're working in a day. For example, if I spend nine hours wrenching on a truck and I work 10 hours, I'm 90% productive. Easy as that. But right now, we are sitting about 88% productive year to date, so we're missing out on 7% of our goal, or roughly 28,300 hours of wrenching time. So we figure if we can capture 75% of that missing time, we're bringing back about 21,200 hours, or roughly $382,000 worth of value added services at a $15 an hour wage. And with bringing more work inside, not only are we decreasing our cost, which is our next concern, we're increasing the amount of eyes getting on our equipment. We have faith in our technicians, our shop management team. We know exactly what's being done. That's at a better price. We can keep our drivers in and out of the shop quickly. And the quicker they're in and out, the more they're moving, the better they're, the more happy they are. The company's happy, they're making money. It's a win-win for everyone. And again, touching on the cost piece, with bringing more work inside, if we're having more hours available, we are decreasing our outside spend at outside dealers or vendors, truck stops, dealerships, you name it. And year, to, year over year, we've saved about a million dollars moving it from that outside cost category back in-house. So that's awesome to see. Uh, everyone's pretty happy about that and the outcomes of this dashboard so far. And so I kind of just want to share with you, share you guys that demo and our benefits so you kind of get an idea of how we use this type of data in our company. And I'm going to turn it over to Alex to let you see how we came up with this. So. All right. Thank you, Matt. Um, so before we get going too far, we're going to show you a few SQL scripts. Um, they will be provided on the Tableau website, so don't feel the need to rush to write it down or anything. So uh, within these use cases that Matt showed you, this data doesn't just come about overnight. It took quite a while in order to get all of this data put together, as well as figuring out some of the little nuances that we kind of ran into and to make this product a reliable table that we can use consistently and have many people help us with creating these geofences. So we're gonna go ahead and start from the beginning and we'll create a table. So on the left-hand side here, I've already got my geo database created. We'll come down to tables and right-click, open up the new table diagram, and we're going to give it uh, four total columns. The first one is going to be an ID column. We're going to give it a data type of int, and we also want to set it as a primary key by right-clicking on our column, choosing set primary key, and then we also want to make it an auto incrementing. So we'll go down to the is identity specification and we'll change is identity from no to yes. And our first column is now set and ready. The second one we're going to add is a code column and we're just going to give that nvar char 50. Within our base AS400 system, we have customer codes that are unique for every single one of our customers. And so that's what we're going to use to tie back to this table to get our geofences. Uh, as well as our maintenance system, they also have unique codes for every shop, fuel stops, just about anywhere our truck could specifically be pinpointed, we have a code for that available. The next column will be geography, and that will be of the type geography. And the last one we're going to add in here is type, and that's going to be NVAR char 50. And we use that similar to the code column so we can separate out our different code types. Uh, for Matt's analysis, he only really cares about the shops that we have, so it doesn't make sense for him to run all these spatial queries against all of our geofences when we can quickly and easily narrow it down to just our shops. When we have our table ready to go, we'll go and give it a name. I'm going to call it geofences. And we'll go to the left-hand side to file, save geofences, and we refresh our object explorer. And you can now see we have our table added. 
the next step is we're going to want to add a spatial index. This will allow us to quickly query our data out and compare it with our other joins. So we're going to drop down our geofences table, go down to indexes. You'll notice that when we created our primary key, it already added the initial index. In order to create a spatial index, this key needs to be in place, so it's important to make sure you add your primary key. We'll right-click indexes, go to new index, and click on spatial index. This page, we're prompted to add a column. So we'll click on add, and we're going to choose our geography column, and hit OK. Next, we need to give it a tessellation scheme. So we'll go down to the spatial tab, and we're going to choose tessellation scheme, and we are going to choose the geography auto grid, and then we'll hit OK and apply it. So a tessellation scheme is very important for understanding how a spatial index works. By looking on this chart, in the lower left-hand corner, you see you've got that red grid of cells. So in this example, there are 16, and imagine that's covering the entire globe. So you take one of those cells, and you break that down into 16 cells further, and you keep doing that for every level of your tessellation scheme. The geography auto grid that I showed you is unique. It allows us up to eight levels of this tessellation scheme, with the topmost level being 256 cells, with each layer below that being comprised of 16 cells each. And you can see above the green one how you've got that final diamond. It gives it an index that it can then compare to your other spatial data types to quickly figure out where these items are. Within SQL spatial data, in creating polygons, there's what is called the left-hand rule. And this is very important, because if you draw a ring in the incorrect direction, you will be selecting everything but what you want to select. So imagine that you're walking around your polygon as you're drawing it. You're going to want to be walking around your left hand and what's in the center is what you will be selecting. But oftentimes, if you have a bunch of users that are helping you get all the spatial data put together, it can be just a thing that kind of slips the mind. I know I've done it on occasion. So what we've done is we've worked with our DBA and we created what is called a trigger. So what a trigger does is whenever a table insert is made, it will insert this script and run it right after that insert. So what we're going to do is there's a function called envelope angle, and when it equals 180, that means it is drawn incorrectly. So after every insert, and where the geography dot envelope angle equals 180, we're going to update the geography field to the geography dot reorient object. And so that will flip the ring orientation. So with this trigger, no matter which way we draw our ring, it will be inserted correctly into the table every time. And that has reduced a lot of maintenance issues for us with having to find where these are and making sure that they are correct so we don't have any errors. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. And if we refresh on the side here and go to triggers, we can now see we now have our trigger added. One more thing we need to do before we can go and start creating some of this data is we need to initialize the table because we're going to use a program called QGIS and unfortunately it won't see our table unless we have some data in there already. So this is what we were using before to insert our polygons. It's a list of your Latin long pairs in order to create it. So as you can imagine, it takes a long time to create some of these by just click, right clicking in Google Maps, figuring out what that point is for every single point that you want to put on your map. So I'll go ahead and run it. And you can see we've got one row affected that's been inserted. And then if we open up this show geofences, you can see we now have our geography inserted. And there is our polygon that we created. Now that we have that ready, we're going to jump over into QGIS. 
QGIS is an open source software that we have found to be very useful. Uh, I've got the link included in the slideshow later on, so you can go back to it after the fact. Um, but since it is open source, we have chosen to donate to this project because it has brought us a lot of value. So once you have QGIS opened and installed, we're going to want to add a couple of plugins that will help us create some of these views. The first one is going to be geocoding. And what that allows us to do is to search for specific addresses so we can quickly and easily find uh, where we're going to draw our shape. The next one is Quick Map Services. This allows us to put an underlay of Google Maps, Google Satellite, uh, any other map that you might want to use so that you can get a reference of where you're actually drawing these. So first we're going to go ahead and add our Quick Map Services to our view. You can use the search string, but since I've already got Google Maps here, I'll click Add and then same for Google Satellite. And in the Layers box in the lower left corner, you can see that they have now been added into the layers. Next, we're going to connect to our SQL table. We will right click on MSSQL, open up a new connection. I'm just going to call this one SQL. And my host is localhost slash SQL Express. And I'm going to leave trusted connection selected, but talk to your DBA. Uh, we also have a user that is called Tableau Maps that has limited access to just our spatial tables, so we can have somebody else help us make these while only giving them access to those tables. Once we have that, we'll click on List Databases, and you can see GeoDatabase has now popped up. One last thing before we leave this menu, we want to make sure we deselect only look in the geometry columns metadata table because we are using the geography data type and not geometry. So we'll hit OK and you can see we now have our SQL connection on the left. We'll twirl that down and you can see our geofences table is here so we're just going to double click it and it is now popped into our layers. Now you can see we're completely zoomed out. We have no idea where this layer is. There are a couple of search features that QGIS has included that makes this really easy to find. We can select by feature. So you can see that we've got the three additional columns we added when we created the table. So we could search by ID, we could search by code or type. Since this was the first one I entered, I'm just going to put in my ID of one and hit zoom to features. And you can see we now have our polygon on the map. But it's not very useful to us with such a solid color there because we're not quite sure what's behind it. So we can do that by going to our geofences layer, right click, go down to properties, go to this symbology tab, and we can drop our opacity to 50%. We'll hit OK. And you can see that we now have a geofence of Tableau headquarters in Seattle. So now that we've got all of these pieces ready to go, we're going to want to start creating some of these geofences. This is where we're going to start using our geocoding plugin. So we've got on the plugins, geocoding, and it'll pop up. So I'm going to go ahead and geofence the conference center. So I'll type in Ernest N. Morial. We'll hit enter, and it'll pop up, and it'll give us a list of options we can choose from. So I'm going to go ahead and click the convention center and hit OK and the map has automatically zoomed us over the convention center. And now you can see the satellite view kind of popping up behind. If I go over to the Layers tab, I can enable and disable the Google Satellite and Maps layer so that I can use both of them together to kind of get my bearings with what I want to geofence. So now that we've got this all ready, we're ready to start creating our polygons. So we're going to want to make sure we are on our SQL table. So click on the geofences layer. And then we're going to go up to the edit toolbar. To enable, you just click on this toggle edit or the pencil. And then we're going to go to the create polygon feature. So you'll click on that tool and you'll notice we have this crosshair here. And all you need to do is start clicking and it'll start creating your polygon. You'll see these red lines pop up and it'll see kind of an area. 
So I'm going to go around the whole building. And then if I right click, it'll come up with the prompt. Uh, we're going to leave the ID blank because we have it set to auto increment. We're going to give it a code, so I'll call it Ernest N. Memorial Convention Center. And I'll just do a type of CONV. And then we'll hit OK. Now, this change has not been pushed to the SQL Server yet. In order to do so, we need to click the Save icon. So we'll click Save. We'll come back over to SQL and run this. You can see we now have this new geofence added. I'll add a WHERE statement where ID is greater than 1. Run it again. And you can now see that we have uh, the polygon in SQL Server. Uh, in just a minute here, I'll show you how to draw it in the incorrect dimension direction and show you that it still shows up correctly within the server. So now that we've got this created, if you zoom in here towards the bottom part a little bit, you'll notice I didn't exactly fit the form of the building. And if I want to get it a little bit tighter, I can edit some of these points after the fact. So I can use the vertex edit tool. So when I'm out here, you can see I can hover over a line. If I hover over the line, the entire line turns red, and it, we can move the whole line in and out. I can hover over an existing point and move just that one point in and out. And if you look real closely, there's a crosshair right there when I hover over it. That will allow me to create a new point. So if I'm going to create a notch here, I'll create a couple of new points. And you can see I've now notched this in. And I'll hit Save, which will push it back over to SQL Server. We'll rerun it. And you can see we now have the notch put out. So it's very easy to add and create new polygons and get these settings saved live back over to your database. Now, let's go ahead and we'll create one in the incorrect direction over the Superdome. Hope you guys are ready to party tonight. So notice I'm drawing it clockwise instead of counterclockwise. And we'll right click. We'll just call it SD for Superdome and type stadium. Hit OK. We'll save it out there. And now we can rerun this. It's now added. And you can see that the inside is selected instead of everything but that inside. So you're also able to manage some of these objects within QGIS. Say we no longer have a need for the Superdome or somebody accidentally duplicated a record. It's very easy to delete these as well. So what you'll want to do is use one of your selection tools. Again, you can use this search by feature where you can input an ID code or type. Um, or you can just use this click to select tool. So I'll click it and it'll highlight in yellow. And then all I'm going to do is click on the trash can in the Edit tab. And we'll hit Save. And now you can see it is now gone. So it's very easy to manage your database. Uh, we've got several users that are set up with this so they can add and remove geofences. And I've also had our DBA create us a job so that every night it'll take a snapshot of this file. So if somebody were to royally screw something up and delete half of all of these, I could just go back to the previous night and back it up. And then we're taking a weekly snapshot back for forever just so we have some sort of reference point and because there's not a whole lot of protection against deletion except for uh, your, uh, training your users about that. So uh, before I hand it, well, I've got one more thing to show you here. So now that we have these geofences created, we're going to want to geocode our GPS data. So at Crete, we've got 5,000 trucks and 13,000 trailers that all have telematics on them. That table is well over 300 gigabytes alone. So we have a wealth of data at our disposal. So in order to use the geographic point with these polygons, we need to run this geography point equation on our latitude and longitude. 
Uh, you can see there's a third argument in there. Uh, that is called the spatial reference ID. And what that does is tells your mapping software of what projection to use. If you're in the United States, typically it'll just be that 4326. Outside, a quick Google search will tell you what you might need to use. And then if we run it, you can see we now have this geo column that has been added that has all of these geocoded points. So one more thing before I hand it over to Matt, I'm gonna insert one of our terminals so he can use this table live. And what Matt's gonna do right now is he's going to talk about a couple of our spatial functions that we use uh, within these vizs and show us how we can integrate the geofences along with these geo points. Thanks, Alex. So within SQL Server, there's three primary spatial functions we like to use at Crete. Uh, and before I show you them, I wanted to stress that capitalization is very important to get the function to run properly. You will see in our examples, the first three letters are capitalized, and even the format from the start to the end of the function needs to be as followed. So our first example I want to show you is stContains. This function is going to return a one or a zero. In the output, if it is a one, that means that that GPS point is fully enclosed within your geofence or polygon. Vice versa, if it's a zero, that means it lies outside the polygon. So in our example right here, we're selecting the code or the geofence in our unit number, the table that Alex made, the geofence. This driver locations is our last truck ping. And in this format, the geography.st contains geography equals one. We only want to pull records that are in our geofences. So when we run it, you see that Tableau and this memorial or convention center are null. We don't have any trucks there. But in our Lincoln shop, we have 184 trucks. And very simple. It's a yes or no type of deal. Really helps us limit our data since we have so much GPS data. Now the next example, which is very similar to that ST contains function, is ST intersects. Again, it's going to return a result of one or zero, one meaning that that GPS point intersects your geofence at somewhere. If it's zero, it means it does not intersect. So in our case, our trucks are just a single dot. So imagine a circle. That circle is either going to be in the circle, or that dot is going to be in the circle, or outside the circle. ST intersects, now imagine a line. The line could be all the way in the circle, it could be half in, half out, or it could be all the way outside. So that's kind of the difference between ST contains and ST intersects. Just as a side note, uh, Tableau 2018.2 has the ST intersects function included in the default table joins. So, uh, when we were originally learning about this, I kind of learned on the ST contains function, so that's why a lot of ours currently uses that, but as we start using more and more of the functionality built into it, we'll start moving over to the intersects function. Thanks, Alex, for that note. Again, similar to our last one, pulling our geofence, our truck, same setup, just using ST intersects and the equal one. So we only want to pull back those points that intersect. Again, we have two nulls, the Tableau headquarters and the convention center, and then 184 trucks at Crete. Again, in our case, both queries are gonna operate the same way, being that we're only a point, we don't have a route or a line of data. And our last function that's gonna relate back to that first uh, demo I showed you is ST distance. This one is gonna return a result in meters so fun fact for you, there's 1,609 meters in a mile. So being in the US, we're all about our miles. So in this example right here, again, we're pulling back our geofence code, our unit, and then this function right here, we're divi dividing this ST distance by 1609 because we want the result in miles, and vice versa in our join, we're saying less than or equal to 50 times 1609, we want to go out 50 miles from our geofence and figure out what trucks are within that area. So we're going to execute it. And you can see we got a lot more records. We have 289. We have about 16 trucks within 50 miles of the Tableau headquarters. And then several that are by the convention center. 
and some that are next to our Lincoln terminal. Now, a quick note, if it's a zero, it mean, that is just simple as saying, hey, it's already in our geofence. You're good to go. Now, briefly on all three of these, they can be used in your select statement. They mean you're used in your joins and even your where clauses. So it's a very, very simple but very powerful tool that we use to figure out if we have certain trucks in our field or close to so we can, again, have more visibility and bring them in and out of our shops as we see fit. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Alex and we're going to run through a few more Crete specific examples. All right. Thank you, Matt. So we're going to pop back over into Tableau and we'll just run through a few of our quick and easy use cases. So our first one here is a national truck map. And what this gives us is visibility into where all of our trucks are located at throughout the country. So I'm going to go through one of our main uses for this. So we have this column that is unseated trucks, meaning we don't have a driver in them. If we have a truck that those wheels aren't turning, we're not making money. So we want to try and get people into those seats. So you can see on the right hand side under status, we've got several status available. So we've got terminal and shop uh, out of service, but we're going to be focused on our ready trucks. Those are ones that are just coming out of the shop or sitting at one of our terminals that are currently ready to go and be seated. So if we have a new driver that comes fresh out of orientation and we need to place them, we're going to look at this map and figure out where these trucks are currently ready to go so we can schedule arrangements to get them out to that truck location. Now in our actual dashboard, we've got a little bit more specifics than what we've got shown here just because we need to know exactly where, town, city, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, we can also use this to evaluate trucks in the shop so we know if we need to call an outside vendor to ask them when this truck's going to be ready or work with one of our shop managers to get it moving out, we are ready to go there. Um, I'm going to give it back to Matt for a second. He's going to go over a, another one of our use cases. Oh. Sorry. So our next use case that we use as a maintenance team deals with what we call a lot check. Very simple. We have a technician or someone within our shop team have to take a piece of paper out, walk the yard, write down every piece of equipment that is there, truck, trailer, if it's hooked, then they have to walk back inside, sit down at a computer, type it in Excel, send it off, someone compiles it, and then they send it off. So you're thinking, well, that's an inefficient use of both time and money, but we need to figure out how to get this important task done. Because again, at Cree, we're all about visibility. We want to know where our trucks and trailers are at all times. They're expensive. They're obviously a very valuable part of what we do in our operation. So we were tasked with trying to figure out how to use, again, the spatial data that Alex set up in a more efficient manner, help our shops out, as well as make the process a lot smoother, quicker, and easier to use. So that's where we transitioned back into Tableau. And again, very simple dashboard. But our end, again, our end users are, are the maintenance team. They want something quick, easy to read. So on here, all these specs represent our 16 shops throughout the country. We're going to go filter down. We're going to use Kansas City as an example. So when we filter down, we can see our outline geofence. Again, and all these points represent a truck or a trailer. So if we go click on one, you can see over here it gives us the detail. So that Kansas City, this truck number, and if a trailer's hooked to it, that will be populated. So the whole goal behind this was to get it live and up and running, we can give our technician, since we're still in the testing stage, a tablet, we can print it out for them. They can make a quick lap around, kind of confirm if that truck or trailer is still there. Since we do get inaccurate pings sometimes if our telematics are screwed up. But the benefits from here, while he's getting that to move over, I'm really excited about the extensions API and some of the implications we can have with that. Because if we have a a technician roaming around with a tablet and he can just confirm he could click that point and check it off that yes it's there if it's not he could go and live update that so we can push it back into our system so a few of the benefits that 
we've seen throughout our testing here. So at our current levels, the old way, pen and paper to the computer. Say we have 16 shops, so we're spending roughly 16 hours a day doing this activity. 96 hours in a week, using a six day work week, and roughly 5,000 hours in a year. And again, at $15 an hour, we're roughly spending $70,000. So we, need to, we definitely need to figure out a more efficient way to benefit from Tableau and this data we have. So in our shops we've tested, we're going with, we're reducing about the time in half, because they still have to walk the yard. So again, we're just cutting those times down in half. So we're saving about 2,500 hours in a year, or equating about $35,000 a year in value added services. Again, kind of tying that back to our routing piece earlier I mentioned, with those hours we saved, we can route more equipment in, get our own eyes on it, do the work that needs to be done, make sure it's done on time, keep our drivers moving, and it kind of just benefits everyone at the company in a better, quicker way. So as mentioned, and the testing process, but hopefully soon we can transition out and really bring to life the benefits of all the spatial data we have at Crete. I'm going to turn it over to Alex for one last example before we wrap it up. And with this as well, as we start proving out some of the accuracy of our GPS and gain trust in this data, we could almost eliminate this entire process and strictly go off of just the GPS pings where they are. Um, currently, we're at about three decimals of accuracy, which is within about 10 meters, but our new products that we're implementing now can go down to six decimals of accuracy, which is down to about 10 centimeters, which is outstanding. So these, these technicians can walk out on the lot and know exactly where this truck is if they need to go and pull it back into the shop. So this last use case is just kind of a generic one, uh, just to give you an example of a couple new functionalities. Uh, so you can see this is just a handful of our trailers, uh, as well as the GPS coordinates that is uh, set into a line string based on the timestamp. So what we can do with this is we could evaluate the route lines that our truck drivers are given, and we can compare that to the actual route they took to see how far they may have deviated if they did. Uh, we can also evaluate individual points. So if I zoom in here into Pennsylvania, right around our New Kingstown shop, we'll see a lot of like zigzags kind of happening. And that's right where the trucks might be moving around the shop lots. So with that, we'd be able to see what time a truck or trailer entered into a customer geofence. So when we're working with customers for on-time delivery and they're trying to maybe dispute whether it was on time or not, we can go back to this geodata and confirm, well, according to our GPS systems, we're showing that here is the point where they officially crossed into this geofence and when they might have crossed out. Um, or if we're billing trailer detention, we know when this trailer entered in, and if we haven't agreed upon, say, three days for that customer to hold onto that trailer before they either need to have it emptied or reloaded for us to take out, we can confirm when they got in there and start billing them after that fact based upon our agreements. So you can see there's a lot of possibilities with all of this data. Um, and we understand not all of you might be in the trucking industry, but there are so many other industries that you can apply some of the same logic. If you're in the public, in, public service industry, for instance, and you're trying to place a new police station or fire station, if you've got the GPS coordinates of each house or even just a neighborhood in general with populations, you could use that ST distance equation and geofence your current uh, fire stations or what have you and see how much outreach is within like a two mile radius so you can try and balance that coverage or see which areas might be underserved. So uh, just to kind of go over a little bit of what we talked about today, we went over how we can actually create these spatial tables within SQL Server so that way you can create a consistent and reliable table that is going to serve you well for the time to come. We went over how to create these polygons within QGIS. Uh, you can use whatever software you like. I know Esri has a paid product, but that can tend to get rather expensive, but it does have a lot more features for you if you'd like. Um, then we went over how to geocode our existing data. Uh, so that 
uh, equation that we showed you earlier, we had our DBA bake that into several of our tables so we didn't even have to run that function. When we see the tables, it's presented to us in the correct format already, so we can just start joining right away within Tableau. Uh, and then Matt also walked you through several of our geo functions that we use. Uh, there are plenty more where that came from. Uh, you can use Google to kind of search for those or look through the Microsoft directory. Um, but before we close, we'd like to open it up and see if there are any questions that you guys might have. Yes? Um, it's just kind of pushing through it. I mean, so we used an existing uh, provider before called iBright, and so they already did a lot of grunt work there, so I leveraged their API to import kind of our initial push of data. Bright, I-B-R-I-G-H-T, and it's uh, our refrigeration units, it's tied to it, so it just has all that in there. Um, but their application is very similar to QGIS. And I think what we've kind of talked about doing is from our customer database, we already have a Latin long for each of our customers. So what we've talked about doing is just taking that existing one and then going up by a couple degrees above, below, left and right to create a diamond around it and then have that populate into our database. And then they do have a function called ST area. So basically you just find everything that's equal to that s small area and then if it's equal to that then it needs to be done. And then we kind of just ranked it from our most important customers to our least important and just start trudging away at it. <laughs> Cause yeah, there's no easy way. I don't know. No. From the shop side, so we had the 16 locations and before we started really using QGIS team of maintenance analysts, we went through, mapped out how Alex showed you the Latin lo longitude points for all 16 shops and then also 70 plus vendors that face our, or work with our shops. So that was a little tedious, but. Yeah, they did that for yeah. 70 plus customers. So that took them a long time yeah. to implement. Yeah, There's three <laughs> of us and it took us a couple hours and we just sat there and complained because we had Google Maps open on one, this open on the other and just clicking and you have to get the exact points, so was a little tedious. Mm -hmm. We are not yet. I mean, that's been tossed around possibly. Um, we're still, we've got a lot of it implemented, but we're currently in the middle of changing over our communications to PeopleNet. So once we get that ironed out, then we'll probably start taking a closer look at doing more of this integration. I am not entirely sure if there's a way to look up that type. I know you can do some joins within QGIS, but we haven't really experimented with that much. For the most part, it's we have a list of the ones that need done. So somebody goes and they, they just kind of pick a code, geocode it, and then save it out. Yep. Yeah, we've got a lot of opportunities ahead of us, and we're, like I said, we're still kind of in the early stages of implementing this, so we're excited about the opportunities we have to make it better. Any other questions? All right, well, before we close, um, we'd like you all to just kind of take a minute and kind of think about some of these things that you may have learned here today and uh, what you guys can do to implement these at your own workplaces.
And then as Alex said, we just encourage you to try to take something you learn back to your companies and incorporate it how you see fit. Please remember to take the survey. Uh, let us know how you think we did, if there's anything we could have done better. And then uh, there are emails. Uh, feel free to jot those down if you'd like and send us an email if you have any other questions. But uh, we'll stick around for a little bit if you'd like to talk with us after the fact. Thank you. Thanks.